Welcome to the More Perfect Union, the podcast that offers real debate without the hate. I'm Kevin Kelton, and tonight I am joined by Greg Matusak. Hey, Kevin. You know, I, I didn't have the best week this week, but I can always take solace that as bad as my week was, I know that other people are having worse weeks, and it, I should really take, you know, put some perspective. So I know people like, you know, like uh, Representative Madison Cawthorn. Um, I know he had a worse week than I did. So I always try to keep these things in perspective. So thank you, Madison, for, you know, making me feel a little bit better with how shitty your week was. (laughs) That's what we love about you, Greg, your empathy for other people. Or schadenfreude, (laughs) whatever. (laughs) And also here is Joe C.R. Hey, this is the best part. This is the best thing I got going this week. So thank you for having me again. (laughs) You want to tell the audience why? I am not the only Joe in podcasting that's recently gotten over COVID. I, however, (laughs) was forced for the first time in my life to use marijuana medically, and it did not feel natural. (laughs) Oh, wow. Wow. (laughs) Wow. There's there's a topic for a later discussion. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) And joining us is J.R. Roloff, a friend of ours from Facebook. Uh, J.R., welcome. Hey there. Um, I I just want to say that I am ever so glad that I didn't wake up to find Ted Cruz in the passenger seat of my semi truck. <laughs> <laughs> and that, although that's a funny line, you actually do do some trucking. Uh, well, why don't you tell us a little bit about your your kind of resume per se, and just bring the audience up to date on why we thought you'd be a great person to have on this week's show. Well, Kevin, that's uh, that's uh, kind of you to say. I um. I was asked to join uh, this conversation because I do drive truck for a living. And uh, oh, a long time ago in another life, I were I was in the army and I was a uh, in I was in armor. Uh, I was you know I can I can drive, load, shoot, and command a main battle tank, um, wow. or at least I could wow. in in 1989. Uh, so between my logistics background and my armor background, Kevin thought I might be a good fit for today's show. Absolutely. Oh, and, you, and your current background. I, 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 you know, people who, people who drive a uh, truck I, I, are the lifeblood of this country. If you ask me, I mean, it's a huge, huge responsibility. I mean, and, and, and I'm yeah. not just saying that because you're bigger than me um, <laughs> and you know well, how to, how, how to, you know, operate a tank. I mean, uh, well, I don't have a tank in my hip pocket, Greg. You're safe no. for now. Well, you say that, but <laughs> <laughs> so let's start with with that. Uh, Ukraine obviously is the not only the big story in the news; it's almost the only story in the news these days. And uh, as we broadcast, it seems like the assault on Kiev might have begun. We're not a hundred percent sure, but that's what the news reports seem to be indicating. So, JR, I'm going to start with you because one of the reasons that I wanted to invite you on is you and I had a fascinating conversation uh, in a long thread with other people this past week about what's going on with that 40 mile convoy. Now, just to bring the audience up to speed, we heard some reports today that the convoy is dispersing a little bit into the woods, not moving forward, but maybe spreading out a little bit to avoid being hit by enemy fire. But, you know, let, uh, let's just go into the weeds right there. Okay. Here's a convoy that they sent in. Everybody assumed it was on its way to Kiev or another major battlefront. And then it seemed to stop for 8, 10, 12 days on end. Well, what is your theory about that? Well, my theory is one that is informed by uh, my my past life in the army and my current life in uh, transport and logistics, it, it's a, it's a question that has a manifold answer. Um, but broadly it boils down to crap vehicle design, crap vehicle maintenance, and particularly crap tire maintenance. Um, Could there's elaborate on that, please. Yeah. Um, there are some people who have pointed out that the wheels on these Russian wheeled vehicles 
are almost certainly Chinese made copies of the uh, Michelin, I believe it's the XRM20, which is itself a good tire. And these Chinese copies are not terrible tires. But when you put them on a vehicle, park them in some motor pool somewhere, don't move the vehicle, don't cover the tires, don't rotate them out of the direct sunlight, they degrade very quickly. And if you look at some of the pictures that you see on the internet, you'll see sidewall rips uh, in these tires. And the interesting thing is, is when you lose one tire, you're going to start losing more and more, more frequently on that vehicle because each tire has to carry then a greater proportion of the load. So the problem just snowballs, you know, so the, the BTR has, um, it's an armored personnel carrier and it has eight tires. If they lose one, that means seven tires have to carry that load. And then, you know, if the other tires didn't get any better maintenance, then they are going to you know, suffer the same fate eventually. Um, I don't think ultimately that the generals planned for logistics as well as they should have. Uh, you mentioned that, you know, you couldn't understand why they weren't getting resupplied. Well, resupply takes its own chain of logistics. Sure. Mm -hmm. You know, you could, mm -hmm. you know, if, if they had the tires stockpiled within helicopter range, they could maybe start airlifting in those tires but then the helicopters need support they need fuel they need maintenance they need pilots you know they need mechanics and equipment on site to change out tires and i just think it's very interesting that this assault on kiev has was stopped literally in its tracks or on its tracks because nobody thought to check tire pressures over the past six months okay and so we had an interesting mini debate going on because I think you, your theory is the leading theory and the most likely theory, and there's a lot of evidence to support it. But there is some evidence that makes you wonder about it. Well, let me ask you this before I go into my counter theory. You send people into a, an environment like Ukraine, which um, my understanding is is a very cold environment right now. How long can men live in that cold in a truck? Does the truck give enough insulation along with whatever protective clothing they're wearing to, to stay for, for 10 days on end and not freeze to death? <laughs> not really. You know, I'd be surprised if they don't, if they're not starting to have trouble with troops getting sick. Uh, Russian field rations are not terribly palatable. They're not terribly nutritious. Um, a lot of fat, a lot of calories. It'll keep a person mm -hmm. warm. But, uh, you know, give it a couple of weeks and you start getting into the, you know, getting into the upper layers of malnutrition. Um, their clothing is just as cheap as they can make it. You know, their clothing is considered a munition. It's used until it rots right off and then they get new, which is no better. You know, their cold weather gear is okay. Uh, not at all like ours. So, yeah, I, I think that the human element is certainly part of it. You know, these are conscript troops. Back in the Soviet days, Russia had. Oh, they didn't have a real strong core cadre of non-commissioned officers, sergeants, mm -hmm. career sergeants. They relied on on junior officers to fill that role. And those guys just, you know, they get rotated out. So there's they don't they've got leadership problems which are bad enough. They've got uh problems with the bulk of the military, which is conscripted troops who are poorly led, poorly equipped, poorly trained, with poor morale. Yeah. The one thing they do have going for them is that they have got a shitload of people. And quite frankly, excellent generalship. Um, the, uh, the, the very top tiers of their military are quite good. Okay. So that all you know, comports to a lot of stuff that I've heard on the news. I would imagine everybody has. But I'm going to throw out my, my alternative theory. Again, saying not that yours is wrong. Yours, I think, is the most likely but this just strikes me as a possibility, which is, look, it's still the Russian army. We all now realize they're not the, the giant military monolith that maybe we all thought they were prior to this incursion. But it's still a very advanced army, and it's led at the top by mostly competent people who had to anticipate that there would be supply needs, resupply needs that that all has logistical issues, such as refueling. You just don't send tanks and large trucks, large vehicles, down a, a, a stretch of 200 or 400 miles of road. If you know they can only go a third of the way, you plan for that. 
I mean, on gasoline. Yeah. You plan for that. You don't just send them a third of the way and go, oh, gee, we never thought about regassing. <laughs> so my competing theory is, along with any logistical problems that they clearly do have, is it possible that there's also not just morale problems, but dissension problems at the, in the ranks and possibly at higher levels where commanders who went in thinking this was either a training exercise or they were being sent in for some lesser hostile reason, got in there, started hearing the reports, started seeing the carnage and realized, oh, shoot, we've been sent in here to kill Ukrainians and I don't want to be a part of it. And it doesn't have to be every commander in that convoy. If you just have a small but important enough cadre of them to say, we're not comfortable moving forward, we're not going to do this until we know from the top that there's a reason for this attack, we understand the mission. It's possible that a few of those commanders, whatever rank they are, stopped this convoy and said, we're not going forward. Greg, what do you think of, of those two theories and what's or do you have a third? Uh, no, no, no. I, I, I think, as my father used to say, if you hear hooves, I think horses, not zebras. So <laughs> <laughs> as, as, as much as I, I love your your theory. No. The other thing is uh, we, we, we saw this in uh, in the first go, go, in the second Gulf War with uh, logistical issues from America, too. If anyone remembers, there was a issue with uh, armor-plated vehicles, with night vision goggles. These things happen. And as far as gasoline, I think when you're invading a country like Ukraine, I think they honestly believe, like, don't worry, we'll just go to the ESO, which is, you know, we'll see them every, like, 10 feet because, you know. Yeah, right. Okay, Joe, any thoughts? It turns out I had this all figured wrong because when I saw the convoy had stopped for a couple weeks, I'm like, oh, yeah, it's like in risk where you're ready to make that big invasion, but you don't quite have the troops. So you just kind of hang out where you're at. You take a couple turns, you put some more people there, and then eventually you invade. So that's how I've been looking at it is when I was researching it today, I'm like, oh, they just stopped to kind of I didn't know why. But I'm like, they just must be kind of resupplying. Yeah, your theory also floats that they're just positioned them there. And that's where Putin and his generals wanted them, not outside the border, but inside the border. But they're not yet ready to use those vehicles and those supplies. So that's where they positioned them. Yeah. What do you think about the whole kerfuffle over a no-fly zone? Greg, where do you come down on this? It's, It's not a yes or no question. Having a no-fly zone is a giant commitment. We would actually be shooting down NATO forces, potentially be shooting down in acts of war, Russian soldiers. Those could be the steps that could lead us to. Right, right, right. JR, again, you're the guy with the military background. You know better than any of us three. I have to agree with Greg. Um, I think that it's a great soundbite. Um, I think that the reality of the situation is that when you start sending NATO combat fighters in to patrol the skies over Kiev and Mariupol, eventually they're going to run into a flight of MiG-29s and they are going to have to put up or shut up. And once a NATO aircraft is fired upon in an act of war, that trips the Article 5 of NATO. Okay. And where, where you know, an, a, yeah. an act of aggression. An, act, one. an attack on uh, one is an attack on all. Yeah. Yeah. So let me let me float another of Kevin's little theories by everybody. You guys probably heard that there's a corner of the diplomatic debate over this that says, yes, an active no fly zone would clearly be at risk of precipitating war. But what if we created what what I am now calling a please do not fly zone? What they described in these discussions on television, and I've heard this from diplomats and from generals, is you ask the Russians, and with their tacit or even not with their uh, tacit approval, you put planes in the sky who aren't there to shoot other planes down, but to ask them to disarm and leave the area. So it's not a hostile intention. It's more like a... um, we're watching you kind of a, a debate. Now, I don't think that that's realistic because 
why would the Russians pay any attention to fighters that they know are not going to engage them? Yeah. But but I'm going to take it one step further. Sure. What if we had a modified no-fly zone where the rules of engagement are this? If a, and I'll call it NATO, it may not be NATO, it may be some other coalition, but if a Western alliance plane sees a plane in the skies over Ukraine, they are going to follow it. Let them know they're being followed. If that, let's say, Russian plane fires on a target, then they're immediately going to be taken out. And they're told that. They'll say, we are following you. If you engage, maybe with a civilian target, or maybe it's with any target, we're taking you down. It's it's still hostility because there's the chance that the Russian MiG still fires on some target. But might that be a palatable way for the West to engage and try to create a no-fly zone without it being just two fighters fight firing at each other because they both happen to be in the sky. JR, please go. I think that that security theater of the highest order, it, it, what you just described is a no-fly zone under another label. Okay. Um, you know, it, I, I see where you're going. With. I do. But ultimately, what you're doing is talking about air-to-air combat, you know, to keep the, the MiGs from to keep the Russians from, from firing on, on, uh, on civilian targets. Um, I don't think there's a good way to manage this. I really don't. Uh, ultimately, ultimately, NATO's choices boil down to fight or don't fight. And that is it. Yeah. yeah. It's too much of a, of a, of a ballet up there. It's, it's too difficult to, and, and we are going to, if, if you have two planes up there, you know, as my father used to say, I'm going to use him again, F-A-F-O, fuck around, and find out. Um, and we've got to draw that line sooner or later, but right now is not the time. And as long as that convoy and as long as this, and you, you're right, a city is going to be attacked. Not yet. Um, you know what my takeaway from this episode is? Your father had some very colorful phraseology. Oh, my gosh. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, my favorite was, uh, you can find sympathy in the dictionary between shit and syphilis. That's my favorite. <laughs> um, it was a tough childhood because he was a very clever man. But, uh, yeah. And you're six and you have to look up syphilis. Oh, yeah. my goodness. I was like, <laughs> syphil what? <laughs> six, I think I'd already had it twice. There you go. <laughs> So here's a question for you guys. Can someone who has been labeled a war criminal by the international community still continue to lead a major country and still continue to lead diplomatically a country after this whole thing comes to some kind of a resolution? It's been done before. Yeah. Uh, With who? uh, uh, Crap. Charles Taylor of Liberia. um, Paul Pott. Yeah, Cambodia. but they were they were outcasts. They weren't integrated into the the you know international community the way Putin has been over the last 10, 15 years. I have no idea. I really don't. I you gotta remember it's it's not a war crime the very first time it happens. So Okay. No, I, I don't you know what for the past what, 10, 15 years, the international community has been asking yeah, you know, it's asking Putin to play nice and to be part of the team. And he's been like, oh, but of course I will. But that all ended. It's over. And I agree. And you're right. He will, you know, trade will continue with Russia probably. But will he be invited to the G8? Will anybody get their picture taken with him? Will he be like a real? No, trade will probably continue someday. But no, he won't be, uh, you know, no one will call him from the White House ever again. That's that just will never happen. Well, I mean, unless I mean, that's just ridiculous. (laughs) So he will continue. I mean, that's not there won't be a coup over this, but he will not. You know, it will be like a a Middle Eastern dictator because the only difference is it's not in the Middle East. It's an Asian dictator. (laughs) I think, and I tend to be Pollyanna-ish about a lot of these issues. That's true. I like to think I'm a realist, but I also see the glasses half full. 
I think he is going to be overthrown at some point. I'm not saying it's going to happen in March, and I'm not saying it's going to happen in 2020. But um, my thinking is, first of all, I'll answer my own question. I just don't see how you could be an international pariah and still lead a major country that is also a major economic factor in the world. The two don't coexist. You can be Kim Young Jun or Kim Young Un and run North Korea and maybe have a nice, you know, tete-a-tete with Donald Trump. But I don't think you could be Putin, be labeled an, a war criminal, maybe even convicted in some international court as a war criminal, and then just go plotzing around the world and shaking hands, like you said, at the G7 summit with other world leaders. I am old enough to remember uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis and that Khrushchev was all of a sudden not the leader of Russia uh, two years later. Now, I didn't understand the dynamics of it. It was just like, hey, whatever happened to that guy who, who had the funny first name that began with K, uh, last name that began with K? Um, I have a feeling that Putin has set himself up for a fall that he did not anticipate and he does not yet know how to maneuver around. That's my feeling. Only history and time will tell. Okay, okay. This this just sounds like like a Bernie Sanders speech where he says, and 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 the people will rise up because of because of it's student loans. Yeah, no, <laughs> no, no. You know, and and the Russian people will rise up all of a sudden. No, no. It's we're, okay. we're, 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 okay. we're past that. Again, past that. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm betting long here. I'm the one uh, taking the eight to one odds. Yes. Did, you, did yeah. you know in, in, in May of uh, 1912, I, I might get that wrong. Um, there was a riot. I mean, there was an, a, a riot in, in Paris over a piece of music. People were so upset. They freaked out over, um, over Stravinsky's right of spring. Could not believe it. Uh, you know, you know, they were so passionate about it and they were like we can't handle this new type of music polychordality not gonna happen um and that's awesome but you don't see that anymore literally i've been at concert halls and people are like uh oh, yeah i'm not uh that was just terrible i'm not, uh, <laughs> yeah i i didn't get it so what uh, you're saying I, is uh, the world will learn to live with polychordality and with vladimir putin uh, the war criminal uh, polychordality is pretty you know 1920 i mean come on but i mean <laughs> atonality is pretty like yesterday's i mean now we're talking like math rock and stuff like that serialism and stuff but i mean people are just like uh as long as my garbage is getting taken out, I guess I'm OK. You know, Lord forbid gas prices in a capitalistic society goes up 30 cents because, you know, that affects me. But, you know, you know you what know. I always say, Greg, you'll find polychordality in the dictionary between Putin and penis. <laughs> well done, you. Right on. <laughs> right on. Hey, thanks, Dad. <laughs> And I just want to give our listeners an update. A couple of weeks ago, we had my friend Mark Rappaport on the show, and he spoke about the situation of his significant other that we called Polina, uh, who uh, was in Russia uh, when we recorded that. And um, he was talking about the fact that he couldn't convince her of what we know is the reality of what's happening in Ukraine, because she was getting it all filtered through. Uh, Russian media. And she didn't believe that people were dying and that uh, Russian forces were doing what, what they are indeed doing. Just to give an update, um, I spoke to Mark about this yesterday. He finally was able over the course of uh, a week and, and several days to convince her that it was, in fact, uh, getting as bad as he told her it was. She seemed to have internalized the information. She was planning her exit from Russia, planning to get some money from the bank, planning the car drive, but she waited too long. And they have now closed off her credit card. The banks are no longer issuing uh, money to people who have US dollars. And they have closed off the border for people who want to leave Russia. No kidding. So she is there for the haul, and we will. Um, send our prayers and wish her the best, but that's just one person. And you can surmise from that, 
that there's probably hundreds of thousands, if not millions of others in the same predicament. Did anybody here see uh, Donald Trump's interview with Sean Hannity last night? Yeah. Yeah. That was pretty, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty upsetting to listen to that man. Um, Which one? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, Hannity, Hannity is, doing his job to try to spin as much, but he's finally on the right side of history. Let's give him credit. Right. For that. <laughs> Hannity Hannity spent a long time like, okay, this is bad. And all we need you to say is this is bad. And, and, you know, we're talking about Ukraine and he and Trump just wandered and would not say Putin was bad. Ah. He just wanted to talk about the election and about how he was, he would have been such a good press. I mean, it was, it was an odd rambling and it, it's almost sad yeah, that his, it, his mental prowess. And yes, I know I'm going to that, you know, old people don't have it together, but it's, it's almost, I'm sorry, Kevin, I know you're in the room. Um <laughs> <laughs> but it's almost sad. And I know people always say that about Joe Biden, but he couldn't even answer a question. Okay. He couldn't. He, he was the horse that couldn't be led to drink. Water. Well, well, I, I likened it uh, in a Facebook post. And this is definitely an old reference. Uh, very few people <laughs> will know this reference. But first of all, just to give it context for people who maybe didn't see the whole thing. Hannity has come down now forcefully on the side that Putin is an evil dictator who is doing horrible things in Ukraine and something must be done. Okay. Which is where I stand. And I think, you know, 80% of, you know, Americans stand. He was trying to get Trump to acknowledge that even though he had made a thoughtless comment before the invasion, saying that Putin was a genius for blah, blah, and blah. He was trying to rehabilitate Trump. And he kept saying, I know you said this, but I know you, I've known you for 25 years, and you now see that he is an evil person, right? And Trump sidestepped the question. He could not say there is anything wrong with Vladimir Putin. And every time Hannity tried to bring Trump back to decide that he knows his viewers are on, and he knows American voters will be on in one year and in three years, Trump kept sidestepping because, as we all know here, he wants Putin to, again, support him and do horrible things for him to help him get elected in 2024. Yeah. I likened it on Facebook to watching Annie Sullivan trying to teach Helen Keller table manners. (laughs) And if you've seen The Miracle Worker, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, Google it. Because it was that kind of a wrestling match. And that's why I made that analogy. (laughs) Hannity floored me when Trump gave a three minute ramble uh, that had nothing to do with the original question. And Hannity said, well, what makes you say that? And I thought, holy cow, actual journalism from Sean Hannity. Who would have thought? Uh, But looking at it and I've watched it, God help me twice now. uh, What it what I think was going on is that. Trump, in his last little lonely brain cell, thinks that he is going to be elected in 2024. And I believe that he thinks that Putin is going to come out on top in this war, or even last until 2024, which may happen. Uh, The numbers, frankly, are on on Putin's side. And he didn't want to piss off somebody who he might have to be working with in the future. You you know, what's, what's really interesting, I don't know if you guys are getting primary commercials yet. All these... Republican primary ads all are he is this person is the most Trump candidate, the Trump candidate for you, the Trumpiest Trump. And they literally say the most Trump candidate. But if this keeps going, if they if he does not say like Putin bad, America good, then I really see this coming back and biting all of them in the ass. Well, um, we will see. I have a feeling see. that they will. They are going to pull a um, a rope dope on this one and figure out a way <laughs> that they can say we're on the right side of history. But you know, Trump is still our guy. We're going to talk a little bit about the Freedom Convoy. 
which is that still a thing, J- JR? I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> um, okay. Well, I'm nah. going to you first because you are a trucker. That doesn't yeah. associate you with these with these people. But um, where I do you stand on that whole thing? I think they're a bunch of uh, self-centered, obnoxious morons with persecution complex. Um, <laughs> I think that they think they have a legitimate beef. And if you got into trucking back in the 70s before Jimmy Carter deregulated the industry and you have watched it change and watched more and more regulations get pir- get piled on people, watch more and more taxes get levied. Yeah, it's going to seem onerous. You know, there are a lot of regulations that I have to adhere to in my day-to-day life. And if you didn't use to have to deal with that, then I could see where that would seem as a good example of government overreach. Uh, but I, I think that what they're doing, the way they're going about it is unoriginal and derivative at best and actively harmful to what they want at worst. Is it still over masking and, and COVID protocols? Is it still 90% that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it still is. Um, but they want it across all industries. I mean, they, they want their, it's not just the trucking industry. It's the airline industry. It's the medical industry. It's the educational they want industry. No masks, but mask it's not just masks. Lifted. It's also vaccination. It's also, you know, they also I, 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 I'm assuming at this point they don't want people in restaurants who work in restaurants to wash their hands. They want sneeze guards <laughs> removed. I mean, they are just on a tear. And and like you were saying, you're right. In the 70s, if you were making an all beef patty, you didn't have to wash your hands. They trusted you, I guess. America. But now <laughs> you do. And now there is a sneeze guard. Now you do have to clean out the, the uh, ice cream maker at night. Okay. And that's why it doesn't work. Now I want to you know, end on a little bit of a lighter, more, maybe more upbeat topic. Has anybody had a chance to catch the first episode of the new HBO Max series that is titled Winning Time, The Rise of the Lakers Dynasty? Okay, first of all, I'm just going to throw out a way to brag that you have HBO Max. Um, <laughs> I, just, I just love how you're like, that I have HBO Max. Uh, I'm just going to throw that out. Uh, but yes, I've seen it. Okay, I'll throw that out too. I haven't had a chance to catch it because I'm not bougie like you. Uh, okay. But um, I, I will say that anything John C. Riley's involved in is pretty good. Uh, yeah. He's, he's yeah. very good at what he, he does. And he does a good job in this. Yeah. So uh, I I caught it yesterday because, uh, you know, the promos looked interesting. It's an Adam McKay piece. I, I was not blown away by it. This is the second time in a row after uh, his uh, his movie, Don't Look Up. It's the second time in a row that I've been less than impressed with an Adam McKay piece of art. But what really struck me about this thing is, well, first of all, for, again, for listeners who aren't quite up to speed on this, it starts right when Magic Johnson is coming out of college and being drafted or about to be drafted into the NBA. And it's the series is going to be about his journey and the Lakers' journey from 1979 through their uh, very successful period all through the 80s and into the early 90s. What struck me, aside from the fact that I didn't like the stylized breaking the fourth wall and some other stuff, that McKay and their screenwriters had their characters do. Boy, was this thing mean to Jerry West and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. The unflattering depictions of those two men was really striking. And if it's true, okay, they deserve it. But if it's not accurate, boy, was that just a kick in the you-know-what. Well, first of all, as JR said earlier, anything with John C. Riley is awesome. And I think he is kind of an underrated actor. His range is amazing. The stuff he does drama wise is, is just flooring. There's a uh, film he did called, uh, we should talk about Kevin. Oh, that's Um, so good. With with Swinton. Tilda Swinton. It's, it's about uh, the parents of a uh, a student who, who uh, did a school shooting and it's the after effects and the mother kind of saw it coming she had some warnings and the father kept saying no he's fine he's just a boy he's just a boy it's a fabulous film but 
even his comedies. Watch Talladega Nights. Um, and the original person, I don't know if you knew this, was uh, Michael uh, Shannon. Michael Shannon. Thank you. Good points, Greg. So what, what I took away from this is I watched the show. I experienced it. Then I did a little Googling. And I was surprised to find out that uh, a, a very fine actor named Michael Shannon was originally cast to play Jerry Buss, who is one of the two big characters in the movie or in the series, I should say. Michael Shannon dropped out, as Greg said, because he was not comfortable with breaking the fourth wall in the stylized way that Adam McKay was directing him. And they needed to replace him. Now, for people who may not know this, again, you may not be as ensconced in the entertainment industry as some of us are. Adam McKay was a writer on Saturday Night Live who, for the last 20 years or so, has been partnered professionally with Will Farrell. They not only worked together on films, but they had their own production company, which was hugely successful. And Will Farrell was executive producing this series. He had wanted at one point to play. Jerry Buss, but they decided Michael Shannon was the way to go. They cast him. When he fell out, McKay turned around and offered the part to both of their very close friend, John C. Riley, without McKay first telling Will Farrell. And Farrell was so upset that uh, it ended their professional relationship and has seriously hurt their friendship. So that surprised me. Uh, I'm not sure that speaks very highly of McKay, what he was thinking, because you would think you would tell your producing partner about something like that. (laughs) Yeah. Now, I actually watched the show last night. I loved almost everything about it, except the fourth wall breaking. The fact that you had Black Thought on the intro song, you had the stylized way that it was filmed. I enjoyed it. It made me actually go pick up the Showtime book because. Jerry West is like portrayed as such an asshole that I had to, I Googled is Jerry West an asshole. I didn't find any evidence of it. And the only interviews I saw of him, he seems like a very nice Midwestern man. Now, not to say that in his playing days, he might not have been a perfectionist and they almost portray him as like an angry drunk in this they hint at it at the end of the episode. So yes. And that's why I I brought this up because I went and Googled it too, because I had the same curiosity and every person that I could find quoted about it said they felt that this series seriously misrepresented Jerry West. And I got to mention one more thing because Greg always both loves it and hates it when I (laughs) name drop. Okay. And here's my name drop for the week. You ready? Yeah. I was in Norm Nixon's house. No. Yes, I went to a party at Norm Nixon's house. Was he was he was he a nice guy? Or did he get pedicures? He w- <laughs> <laughs> They do not depict him as a very nice man in this film. He seemed like a nice guy the day that I met him. The way that I met him is I worked on a show called A Different World. I was a writer on that show. Yeah. Debbie Allen, who is his wife, was the producer and director of A Different World, and she had everybody over to the house one time. Oh, so there you go. That's the best one of the week. Without a doubt. <laughs> Did he have that no nice basketball that court? Oh, that was that was supposedly Donald Sterling's house in the in the show. That oh, was, okay. Uh, I missed that. <laughs> yeah, that was some basketball court. Yeah. I don't believe that he played a magic one-on-one and he started wearing a fur coat, but whatever. <laughs> 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 and I also don't believe that magic could have lost as badly as they depicted it in that episode. Uh, That said, guys, we ran a little longer than I had anticipated. I want to, first of all, thank you, JR, for joining us this week. You were truly wonderful. And uh, Joe, as always, you were a pleasant and a a joy to have with us. And Greg? What are you going to do? Your beard is still (laughs) the best beard of the week. So I I, I don't know about that. JR has given you a little run for the money. JR has given me a lot of run for the money there. (laughs) (laughs) And we want to thank everybody for listening. If you like what we do here, please. Not only like and post our link on your Facebook timeline and tell your friends to listen to us, but please go to iTunes or wherever you listen to the show and rate us, leave a review, tell people what you think of us, and also check us out on Instagram and on Twitter and find out what we're doing there. Hmm. And with that, uh, Greg... What are you going to do to make the the rest of this week and this weekend special in your world? 
Well, I was gonna go to Norm uh, uh, Norm Nixon's, Nixon's yeah house, <laughs> uh, but uh, meet Debbie Allen. But that's not that's just, that's blown out. Of, that's been done. So um, I don't know. I guess I'm gonna call Will Ferrell see if I can become his best friend this week. <laughs> um, now that I know that position's open, uh, Will call me. Ha, 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 ha.